Uh, Avik, uh, can you share your screen? Yep, just uh, sharing it now. Thanks a lot, Avik. Uh, I'll quickly introduce Avik. Uh, uh, um, Avik Day is the CTO uh, uh, of, and a co founder of Ghost Robotics, uh, building uh, quadruped robots. And uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Avik, in the interest of time. Uh, off you go. Yep, no worries. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks again for uh, inviting me to this wonderful workshop. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, the CTO at uh, Ghost Robotics. I founded the company while uh, I was doing uh, my PhD at Penn. Um, actually, uh, last uh, couple of years, I also did a postdoc at Harvard, but now I'm uh, back full time at Ghost. Um, so my history has been working on a lot of bio-inspired robot locomotion um, in a lot of different scales. So though, just uh, recapping quickly the kind of robots I worked on in my PhD, uh, very kind of simple, underactuated, kind of hopping, running robots. So this was a, a tailed uh, two-legged robot. Um, the, uh, the Minotaur robot, which actually was the first, became the first ghost robotics product. Um, very uh, small, direct drive, uh, quadrupedal robot. Um, in my short postdoc at Harvard, I worked on the uh, RoboP project. And uh, yeah, of course, Ghost is uh, you know building robots. The primary focus of the company is this uh, Vision 60 quadruped at the moment, which we're making for you know commercial use. Um, and I'll talk a little more about that. And we're also making the Spirit robot for more research usage. Um, but honestly, the priority, the focus of the company is much more on the larger quadruped at the moment. Um, so the common thread that I you know uh, want to kind of uh, highlight uh, for all of these projects is that. You know, basically all of these mobile robots they have uh, to kind of support their own mass and also support their own computation. And there are, we know there are these fundamental constraints in power, uh, force, and computation, uh, and and you know, how much mass uh, each of those entail. Um, so managing these and kind of optimizing our designs and our algorithms to kind of support uh, this this kind of mobile robotics uh, has been kind of the focus of my my career. Um, so the way that I've uh, always looked at these is kind of uh, principled applications of kind of simpler models uh, to uh, both design and control. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that with the, with the, the uh, new perspective of perceptive uh, locomotion today. Um, so the uh, kind of just to introduce terms, I've, uh, you know, th there are many terms that we can use to describe these kind of hierarchical structures with simplified models, but um, I'll probably be using some of these terms called uh, template and anchor. Uh, this is from a paper with uh, my advisor uh, and uh, Bob Full in 1999. Uh, but uh, they were analyzing animal locomotion, and the idea was that these template dynamics sort of um, are the reduced order dynamics that are become kind of apparent in uh, after uh, some of the control that the animals are doing. Um, I might also use the term anchoring, referring to taking kind of the synthetic act of taking uh, idealized simple simple uh, dynamics, reduced order models, and somehow embedding those on the complicated robot. Um, I'll talk now a little bit about Ghost Robotics. So the company uh, is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we have about 20 people now. Um, and as I mentioned, we have two robots. So this is the, the larger Vision 60 quadruped. Um, it's been sized approximately so that it's you know, easy to climb stairs, um, as you can see. Um, it weighs about 43 uh, kilograms. Our design priorities were to, you know, have something that's pretty cost effective, um, uh, efficient and uh, sealed. So uh, for those we, you know, use more kind of common hardware components, uh, standard drivetrain elements, um, such that the cost uh, isn't kind of automatically increased. Um, we try to move as much of the complexity to software as possible. So there's no joint torque sensing or anything like that. Um, uh, the uh, actuators are torque controlled and we have you know, momentum observers and software like that for estimation. Um, the design, we've really spent a lot of time optimizing as much as possible for mechanical and computational efficiency to kind of maximize the runtime. Um, and we've tried to make it so that it can, uh, uh, it's IP67 actually. Um, the limitation is that we, you know, don't advertise a ton of payload. So the applications that the robot's being used for now are, include, uh, you know, security deployments. So the robot kind of just wanders around carrying cameras or whatever to uh, take, uh, you know, do security. Um, also in construction, again, the robot's kind of mostly doing mobile sensing here, just uh, carrying around higher fidelity sensors that can capture data for mapping environments. 
um, and pretty similar in mining. Uh, uh, all of these environments can be sort of uh, rough terrain, uh, have rough terrain, and uh, which makes legged robots a kind of an attractive proposition. Um, we're also kind of looking at kind of EOD applications where uh, we might uh, have to add some manipulation, mobile manipulation abilities uh, on top of just mobile sensing. Um, uh, yeah, but those are kind of the top applications that we have in mind at the moment. So uh, for all of these, like I was mentioning, there, there's a, we really want to optimize the designs for uh, uh, you know force and power. Um, the motivating uh, 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 approach here, or the motivating you know kind of uh, 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 the reason to have uh, you know focus so much on power autonomy or power efficiency is that uh, you know if we really want to have autonomous robots, we need to have some kind of power autonomy so that the robot doesn't need to recharge itself very often. Um, so our, our robot that uh, the Vision 6C that we've designed so far um, has a range of over 10 kilometers on a single charge, and um, you know depending on the use case, can work for three to four hours. Um, the total cost of transport is quite low. Uh, you know, compared to the kind of state of the art, depending on the terrain. Um, and here's kind of a rough breakdown of the power consumption of different components of the system. Um, and not only do we focus obviously on the actual, you know, the, the mechanical elements and the like, hardware, uh, but we also kind of spend a lot of time thinking about the power consumption of the, the software and the computing architecture. And obviously we don't want to be spending a lot of power uh, doing those things because that doesn't seem like a fundamental uh, constraint to the same extent that the mechanical system subsystems are. So one way to think about this is that, you know, we have uh, computational power is sort of approximately you can think about as the complexity of the computation times the frequency at which it's running. Um, so here uh, is a, you know, a rough table I've put of, you know, the, the types of models that can be used for different types of cal calculations, starting from kind of simple at the top, you know, a decoupled single leg, a floating torso, which we talked about already in this uh, workshop, uh, maybe some model that includes both the torso and the toes. Um, and you know a full dynamic model, and on uh, on the the rows here or, or the columns, I've put kind of tasks that the robot ha might have to do, and uh, you can see that uh, you know these are roughly ordered by kind of the increasing frequency at, at which we might need to be doing solving these problems based on you know intuition at the moment. But you can you know kind of imagine the the characteristic inertias of these uh, different systems kind of dictate how often we have to run these computations. And you know, based on uh, trying to minimize this uh, c times f, uh, we don't want to be in the lower right, and we, uh, you know, would love to be in the top left, but that's not really often possible. So we try to kind of push up and use these uh, different models at different parts of our computation, uh, which is really ties back to this idea of hierarchy hierarchies of models, as uh, you know, depicted uh, in this picture. So uh, one question is, how do we take these kind of simplified template models and you know, anchor them on the robot. And I know this is a legged robot workshop, but um, I just wanted to uh, talk, you know, quickly about one approach that I, you know, uh, is uh, uh, almost published now, uh, where we uh, take kind of a simple idea of a uh, kind of a flying uh, brick. Actually, it's a five dot model for this kind of flapping thing, and apply a template a model predictive control, and then uh, can anchor that on this very complicated RoboV system, which has you know complicated aerodynamics and things like that. So a similar idea can be applied, obviously, to legged robot systems, where um, we've already talked about using kind of floating torso models, uh, where you know if the leg inertias are light, um, then uh, maybe that's sufficient to do the control of the body and stance. And uh, we do something similar for our robots as well. Uh, like uh, uh, you know we have this kind of blind control layer, so all of the tasks that the robots kind of doing in these videos, uh, whether it be running. Um, uh, recovering from perturbations, uh, you know, even climbing stairs like uh, uh, you saw in kind of the previous clip. For all of these, the robot is completely blind and all of the control effort for the body and stance is just going into kind of keeping the, the, the floating torso stable. So um, uh, the reason we talk about blind a lot is because, you know, like in that last video you saw, sometimes perception data isn't reliable, you know, like if the ground is shifting or it's very slippery, uh, like in this clip, um, then uh, it's it's some, it's it's good to be able to uh, have some kind of stability uh, with uh, with our blind locomotion layer, and uh, that gives us an opportunity to use this kind of simplified floating torso model uh, to uh, 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 do our control. Um, so, by the way, the uh, uh, I wanted to just mention that like I've actually been 
there's some research that I started at Penn, but it's uh, still kind of uh, not quite completed. And uh, one of the uh, people I was working with, uh, Turner Topping, he's going to give a talk later today. So I wanted to just kind of advertise that. Uh, we're kind of really looking into the question of which template should be used. Um, so the floating torso using that in all situations may not be ideal. And uh, that's what uh, we're looking at in the research. So, uh, but that was blind, but now obviously, uh, if we want to avoid obstacles with the toes, the, the simple floating torso seems insufficient, firstly, because there are no toes there at all. Um, so what do we do there? So we have this kind of complicated environment where you can see this is, you know, sort of taking a, a point cloud and, you know, fitting some uh, flat regions to it. Um, what we need to do is not just think about how the complicated anchor model maps to the template, but also what the environment um, uh, becomes in when when subject to that you know same reduction same projection of the uh, of the the configuration of the robot. Um, so uh, basically, we've done that, and you can see here uh, we're showing some results uh, now on you know using uh, vision to kind of get an idea of the environment for the and getting an idea of where the toe obstacles are, uh, mapping them into this kind of uh, slightly modified template model and using that uh, for controlling the locomotion so that the robot doesn't need to blindly you know, go up curbs or uh, on stairs, uh, but can uh, use, uh, use the visual information that's available. Um, so the key uh, is kind of selecting a model that is computationally efficient, but also um, can uh, obviously has the information about you know, where, are, where the, toe, toe, the configurations of the toes as well as the body and using them in a, com a computationally efficient way. So we're not 100% sure we have it exactly right at the moment. Um, so we're using a, a, a hierarchical approach with a planner that considers the body and toe obstacles first, and then uh, uh, combining that hierarchically with uh, the same blind controller that I talked about before. But we're working on different architectures as well to see what makes the most sense. Um, we spend a lot of time though on you know, taking the environment and, and coming up with the, what is the free space for this uh, configuration model. Uh, and I think that's kind of an area that I haven't seen so much in uh, locomotion research, but uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting area of research to look at. Um, similarly uh, to the toe obstacle avoidance, you can think about you know, the robots when it's moving uh, through a forest or you know, there are a bunch of uh, obstacles in the way. Uh, we need to figure out how to project these obstacles also into the configuration space of the robot. So we use kind of a simplified idea of uh, uh, treating the environment as a union of convex obstacles and uh, using uh, simple algorithms inspired by uh, some research to um, uh, to uh, uh, kind of uh, efficiently find uh, three paths. As you can see here, kind of an animation of a simulation where you know the center of the robot is kind of kind of what it's doing is it's observing a local uh, a section of uh, obstacles and then kind of picking selecting a local free space and projecting the goal into that free space. So and here's something uh, very similar in action where the robot uh, you know, it's kind of just uh, doing uh, test deployments of waypoint patrolling, uh, where the robot's just given a route to follow, but it doesn't know about the obstacles. So it needs to, um, you know, detect the obstacles online with sensors and navigate around them. Um, so uh, yeah, this is also something, this is a little bit simpler than the, pre the previous, the toe obstacle situation, um, because, you know, we mostly think about the robot in the horizontal plane for these kinds of um, uh, obstacle avoidance uh, algorithms, uh, but it still kind of uh, uh, definitely uh, needs to uh, definitely we need to think more about like exactly if we're going to use point particle models or unicycle models or what kinds of models are most su suitable for the robot's dynamics. Uh, for now, the robot speeds are sufficiently low that we can get away with kind of uh, 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 point particle models, but if the robot needs to navigate obstacles while moving very, very fast, uh, it might need uh, other kinds of uh, template models. And uh, correspondingly, we'll have to figure out how to project the environment into those spaces appropriately. Um, so just to, uh, yeah, I wanted to summarize. Uh, so what we talked about today was, you know, uh, some existing ideas and kind of uh, well understood ideas of how to take uh, complicated robot models and control them with uh, kind of uh, uh, simpler models in mind, like floating torso, like we talked about today uh, in many of the talks. Um, but it's kind of an you know, interesting new uh, area for us at least to kind of think about how to also take the environment and project it into um, our simple models configuration space. 
Uh, so we're trying different versions of this now uh, with some success, uh, but yeah, this is definitely an active area of development for us. So uh, I just wanted to also mention that we're definitely hiring at uh, Ghost Robotics. So uh, if any of these kind of uh, directions of thought seemed interesting to you um, or the applications, uh, please, yeah, please feel free to get in touch. We're hiring in these areas and more. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Avik. Um, great talk as always. Uh, you know, uh, this area is, is a pretty exciting area. It, it is very collaborative, but at the same time, uh, gets a bit competitive as well. So g given the given the current market for quadrupeds, uh, what's what's Ghost Robotics edge? What, where, where do you where do you guys think that you can uh, you can shine? Um, in terms of the applications, you mean? Uh, in terms of the robot and and of course the applications as well. Yeah, I mean, so uh, yeah, we're definitely looking uh, at kind of mobile sensing as the primary usage of this kind of robot. Um, uh, the uh, uh, ability of the robot to go on different kinds of terrain than uh, tracked or wheeled vehicles uh, sort of, you know, gives us a lot of opportunity in, uh, yeah, construction, mining, and, and kind of security uh, type applications um, uh, where, you know, basically the robot just needs to be able to go on more kinds of terrain that than robots have previously been able to. and um, yeah, users have all sorts of sensors that they want to use to sense the environment and want to send the data back somewhere. Uh, so that's primarily what we're looking at. Um, I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there where uh, the challenge obviously is that, um, yeah, it's the, the robots are pretty complex. They, you know, have, we continue adding things to them, adding features, and they keep getting more and more complex. So, um, yeah, the, just, uh, you know, keeping the uh, robot design under control and making uh, everything robust um, uh, for at least a small company like ours. That's uh, kind of been the challenge because we're continuing development uh, as well as uh, kind of supporting customers at the moment. Thanks, thanks, Avik. Uh, any any other questions for Avik? Can, uh, I, did, quick, did, can yeah, I ask I, a quick question? Uh, are you planning uh, to to put any uh, arm on the on the quadruped, uh, given the trend of the <laughs> of the community? Um, well, it's it's not even just the trend, but uh, you know we do have some potential applications in uh, EOD, like I mentioned. So um, it really seems like uh, an arm would really help our robot be used in a lot of other applications. Um, so right at at the moment, we're looking at integrating with some third party arms. To varying success, um, I, I, we, we know that eventually we will like to make our own arm uh, to, you know, be able to more tightly couple the uh, look with the, the locomotion uh, and the uh, arm control. Um, yeah, but that'll take probably maybe next year. Zikra, I'll have some update on that. All right, cool. We look forward. There is one question in the YouTube um, chat by Sangli Tang. He's asking. Thanks for the sharing. Could you please share at what fre frequency can the template model-based planner run? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so right now, actually, we have been running the um, the the all of the uh, the uh, videos I showed about the stair climbing and going over the curves and stuff. That can actually run at a kilohertz, um, even uh, where we you know probably run it at 500 hertz or so um, on uh, an Nvidia Jetson Xavier. Um, it all kind of depends on the complexity of the model, uh, to be honest. So, um, yeah, like I said, we're kind of still optimizing, you know, what, what kind of model to use. Uh, uh, currently, we have this hierarchical structure, which, we, you know, might change in the future a little bit. Um, so that might affect things a little bit, but approximately that's what we aim for, you know, in the hundreds of hertz for control, for the, for, for the planning. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. 